This is Twit. Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. Provide more support for MSP teams by keeping their skills up to date in all aspects of IT, including MS Cloud, AWS, CompTIA, and so much more. Twit listeners will receive at least 20% off or as much as 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan. The discount is based on the size of your team when you fill out their form. So, Jonathan, we're right. seeing something like the same thing going on with Canonical. Is I wrong about that? No, so that, that is what a lot of us fear. Um, the story, the setup here is uh, LXD is an open source container management extension for Linux containers. And it was, it was founded by Canonical, and a lot of the work on it has been done by Canonical. But it's kind of, it's kind of existed apart from Canonical as its own project. And this story kind of starts back on July 4th. Uh, Canonical pulled LXD back in, or excuse me, yeah, pulled LXD back in-house. Uh, the source repository has gone from the LXC Git repository back to Canonical's GitHub account. Uh, and the, the LXD website is now no longer on linuxcontainers.org, but is under ubuntu.com. Uh, Canonical is taking control of the LXD YouTube channel. They've sunsetted the forums. And the LXD continuous integration infrastructure will now be moved under canonical management. Uh, and then the update to that was on July 27th. Uh, another step, and pulling these articles from phronics.com, another step in tightening up control uh, was now that apparently, and this is the one that has a lot of us scratching our heads, apparently LXD maintainership rights is limited to canonical employees. And so what happened is a couple of the other maintainers, uh, I think one of them left Canonical and one of them was no longer at Canonical. But when, when the one left, he got his maintainership rights pulled by Canonical. So no longer as a maintainer. And it's just it's kind of an odd thing because for most of the open source world, maintainership is not tied to employment. So people come and go from companies, but they end up still working on the projects that they care about. Uh, this is this is definitely a thing like at the Linux kernel, for instance, uh, Linux kernel developers tend to be kernel developers first and employees second. Um, and we talked to some of the some of the guys at the kernel and that is the point that they've made, too. So there's this this thing happening that, that really kind of has some people worried. Well, the latest news about this is <laughs> that, that in response to this takeover, uh, LXD has been forked and the independent Incus project has arisen, um, and that is now the official um, the official fork that is part of Linux containers. And uh, so this is essentially the the community saying we are not okay with Canonical uh, exerting this amount of control over something that's supposed to be a community driven project. Now, there's one other piece to this, and uh, that is over the at Hacker News at YCombinator.com. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth actually jumped into the comments and made a couple of interesting points. Um, and one of them that I found the most interesting is uh, he says that they've always tried to be at the forefront of new kernel capabilities, particularly security and container tech. Uh, and it helps that Ubuntu generally has very modern kernels. On Ubuntu, we can make releases of the kernel and LXD that line up nicely. Um, and then he also makes the point that there are no plans to try to prevent other distros from using LXD. It's going to, it's, as far as that part of it goes, you know, playing nice with everyone else, that's going to continue as usual. So the point that he is making is essentially they, they want to be able to make these releases line up for better integration. And that's why they pulled it in house. Um, I'm still not sure what I think about this. It seems a little under, or a little heavy handed, uh, the way that that went, but, I, I'm, I'm holding out hope that they're not going full red hat with this. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting situation. One of the, the thing that you, you said there, which I, I really um, think is, is a really interesting point is that the community kind of came together and said no to this uh, in a, but uh, the, the, the in, uh, Incus, I hope I'm saying that right. Incus project uh, that has been, created is actually basically all the core developers and, and project the original project leader mm -hmm. of um lxd so it's not just a few disgruntled people who might have been slightly associated it's almost the, the core kind of people which is amazing they've basically been able to say look you know you can't take this away from us we're gonna keep it going in another form yeah 
they've essentially said we're not willing to put all of our eggs in in that canonical branded basket. And there's mm. there are some you know some potential resolutions out of this that are that are probably net positive. Um, at this point, probably the best that we can hope for is that Inkis becomes the upstream, and Canonical continues to to work on LXC as the downstream, but pushes code to the Inkis project. Like that, that seems like that would be a a reasonable solution that would make everybody happy. Um, I guess one of the other alternatives is that the community sees that oh well, Ubuntu is handling this well, and we'll refold, you know, we'll remerge the two forks. Um, so I don't, I don't know, I don't know what'll happen, but yeah, it, it's, it's kind of reassuring that the fork got spun up so quickly as sort of that insurance that, uh, we're, we're not losing control of this altogether. We're going to keep something out there that Canonical does not have control of. A question for me for, in both the Red Hat and the Canonical case is <clears throat> given a chance to do it over again, would they do that? Would they do what they did? Would, would Red Hat have put the paywall up, would Canonical have pulled LXD? Probably. In, in Red Hat's case, I think mm -hmm. that was a decision that came down from above, and we haven't seen a whole lot of... Uh, uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of repentance over that decision, if you will. Remorse. I was going to say yes. remorse. <laughs> there you go. And Same then uh, with Canonical's case, it's it's such a new decision. I mean, it, it's still playing out. and and. Uh, I don't know. I feel like we need to give them a release or two and see how it works before we, we really get too, uh, too down on them. Yeah, it, it seems to me there's a, um, I, I mean, many years ago, uh, when I was working in Silicon Valley, I realized there were always these three, three levels of a species, of a corporate species growing. There's, <laughs> there's new, then there's hot, and then there's big. And they're administrated different ways. They have different imperatives. And there's a certain thing that happens once things get big and they get bad <laughs> in certain ways. And, yeah. and it's all, often because they have people on top that have no recollection of what it was that got them there. Um, they're just, or just because big can't move as, as well as, as small, but there's as, especially let's say with containers and other things like this, that we're, it's not just moving up the stack. We're moving farther and farther away from the original, imperatives behind the code base that everybody depends on and lose track of why it was so appealing in the first place. And so it strikes me in, in reading through the Reddit thread there just quickly that you were quoting from, I, I wasn't clear to me whether Shuttleworth was really being defensive or whether, but he seemed to be saying things that were kind of platitudinous, it seemed to me. Like we were always trying to do it this way, always try to do it that way. And he's still in charge. He's still the original guy. So that that's that's not a case where he got replaced. Um, but they're, they're commercial, you know, he, he did s sort of tip his hat to commercial necessities. And, and there's, I think there's always going to be a tug of war between those commercial necessities and trying to keep things open for everybody because commercial necessities tend to be selfish and exclusive and working for everybody is very different. And how do you, how do you keep that, you know, that ant farm going at the base level that you utterly depend on while at the same time trying to make exclusive products at the top that you charge for yeah. and put paywalls up for. Yeah. Mm. So I am pretty convinced that there is not an inherent incompatibility between capitalism and open source. Mm -hmm. um, but I do mm. acknowledge that sometimes those two things are challenging to make work together. <laughs> mm.